Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to episode 10 of Mondays with Mooch. Um, this episode's going to be a little different. So last year, I was on a podcast with my buddy Adam. He's a pretty well-known jiu-jitsu and MMA athlete out in the St. Louis area. He's got his own brand called Imposed Will that makes uh, gis and no gi uh, jiu-jitsu training stuff. And he also has a really great podcast called Outside Perspective, where he does interviews with a lot of guys um, in the Midwest from various scenes. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are, are fighters and jiu-jitsu guys, but he also, you know, covers a lot of different stuff. So that was probably um, one of the more favorite podcasts I've been on. I have a good chance to just kind of tell my story and what brought me out to the Midwest. And, you know, it's one of those things where I've always wanted to hope I could share that story with as many people as I can. So Adam was gracious enough to send me a copy of it and allow me to put it on my channel. So I'm going to release it today under uh, episode 10 of Mondays with Mooch and do what you guys always do. Drop some comments. Let me know what you guys think. Um, you know, click the like button, share it, help me get it out there. Um, make sure you follow Adam's podcast, Outside Perspective. I'd really appreciate that since he's letting me use it. And as always, guys, I really appreciate the support. Thanks. Justin James. Do you go by your actual name? Because I always see like the OG Mooch on right. there. I'm like, does he go by Mooch? Yeah, most people call me Mooch. Some people yeah. call me Justin. And actually, uh, James is my middle name, but because of what I do for work, I've just never put my full name on Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. I don't want clients looking me up. Yeah, I've man. had it happen before. So. The government name will get you in trouble, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm cool with either one. All right, yeah. cool. Well, my, my own brother calls me Mooch, but he's also in the club. Mm -hmm. You know, Hashley calls me Justin. Most of the team call me Justin. Yeah. I think. I think. Yeah, I've always just thought of you as Justin. But then I, I do this weird thing where I uh, I associate a lot of people with the name that I see on social media. Same. So in my mind, it's I know even if I know there's a difference, like in my mind, I immediately go to that first name. Like, oh, that's Mooch right there. That's OG right. Mooch. It's so weird. We, I associate people with a handle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that with whatever I met you as. So if I met you with your regular name before a nickname, yeah. I'll never remember your nickname ever. Because I'm makes like, sense. oh, I met him as Adam. You that, know? That's how you cataloged it. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> And you meet a lot of people over the course of time, and you can only remember so much. Oh, yeah. I can't I remember, remember faces way better than names. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, I'm really good at faces. I'm really good at faces. Especially, like, at the gym right now, there's so many people coming and going, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially at, at up there. At, man, every time I go into uh, in the Heaths, there's – you name it. There's somebody from either another country or another state. It's wild. Just either they're stopping in for the day or they're there for a month. Or right. People, a lot of people stop in with aspirations of being there for a month, but they're not really there for a month. For sure. Yeah, it's so funny, dude. I think that was the difference. You know, I moved out here for the team. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why we moved here. This was pre-documentary. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of people like, and I'm like, oh, I'm moving here for this. No one knew what it was. Right. So it wasn't quite the same. It wasn't cool when you did it. Yeah, it wasn't cool yet. But yeah. I'll tell you the difference is I'm a grown-ass adult that – you know, I'm 40 years old, full-time job, wife. Like, I wasn't trying to live at the gym. And I remember Heath being like, oh, just stay at the gym for a while till we figure it out. I was like, no, nah, I got dogs. Like, right. You're like, know? bro, I got a whole life <laughs> It's here. a different lifestyle for me. So yes. I, I came for the team, but not with those aspirations that a lot of these other guys are coming for. Right. Know? Yeah, I feel that uh, that Heath is the patron saint of lost, lost souls. Like, if you're just a lost individual – Heath is just like, hey, man, just come check it out. Just come right. stay at the gym. We'll figure it out. Just come here. Like, you can be homeless. You can be uh, going through a divorce. You could be just trying to just figure out what the next step is. And he's like, yeah, just come here. Just come right. here. We'll figure it out. And a lot of people are are gravitating towards that place. It's like a mecca now. Yeah. And, I mean, not to sound cheesy, but it legit changed my life for the better. And that's what kind of, you know. The story we'll talk about today kind of over weaves that fact that it brought me here and then the good things that have happened with me being here, not just jujitsu related, just life in general. Yeah, know? yeah. Dude, it's a, it's a cool place, man. Just the whole energy when you walk, or just in Mount Vernon. I really like the energy in Mount Vernon. I do too, yeah. It's very mellow, it's chill, like you get that very small town feel, but um, at least whenever you're embedded into the gym, there's a very like real purpose for being there and yep. you have that community. It's really cool. Yeah. The community is the best part. I mean, that's what attracted me to it too, is it's a group of best friends really. Like, yeah. You know, a, a group of, in bands traveling in vans, living with, you know, all these different guys and then, you know, club stuff, being on the road with people. So we still, it's the same. We have that camaraderie where we're sharing everything. Right. We're all happy to see each other. Like we're just in there together. You yeah. Know? Dude, that's the thing that I miss the most about, um, you know, when you're growing up and you're in sports and you're young, like for me, just being a part of like, 
a team yep. and you have that camaraderie and then you often kind of lose that unless you, you find something like, you know, a lot of people get it in the military or I kind of got it with, with like fighting, but that even that was such an, like an individual pursuit. Right. Um, a lot of us were, a lot of us trying to search for a community. Community is so important. Um, but it's, it can be very hard to find that camaraderie. Yeah. And, and that, he's nailed it, man. Yeah. You know, he did such a good job. It's so vital to like the human existence. So like we need each other. Like, right. Like we need packs. It reminds me of my high school wrestling room. Like that's what I tell people. Like when yes. I first walked in there, like it's hard working, but everyone gets along great. We're right. All pretty much kids that need guidance. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? But, right. But I mean, we're yeah. just kind of all, like you said, just that wayward misfit you know, groups, the guys that all found each other and right. just, you know, the community is amazing. You know, Heath is only four years older than me, but I feel like he's like a, like a dad. Yeah. <laughs> he's younger than me and he's my boss. Exactly. You know I mean? <laughs> he's just, he just has just such a, such a cool presence energy about him. I reached out to him. I was hoping we could podcast this weekend. And, um, I thought maybe it was grapple fest this weekend, but I wasn't sure. Oh, he's yeah. like, ah, oh, brother. He's like, he's like, we're leaving for England. He's like, I'll be back. I think he's, he'll be back on Monday, but they're gone every weekend, every weekend, man, which is so cool to see just the growth and explosion. Yeah. It's wild with that whole team, dude. Plus they're all just such amazing individuals, like such solid humans that yeah. you're like happy to see them doing well. Right. Because you know I mean? none of them have gotten like arrogant or cocky. They're, right. Like, the sweetest, coolest people. Yeah. So you can like picture better people for it to happen to. Yeah. So it's like, you just want to root for them and you're like you're happy that they're being so busy and being recognized and exactly doing so well you know what i what, I, what is so fascinating to me is how uh i think i you you kind of get used to your circumstances you get used to the things that you, you know that you see all the time and for me i'm i'm it's, it's not anything abnormal for me to see somebody living in a gym like I, I've do, I've I've seen it in, at St. Charles MMA for so long, and whenever I found out like all those guys were living in the gym, I'm like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, we got like, a bunch of guys living in the gym and training. Like, it was just it it wasn't anything foreign to me. Right. But then they made this documentary, and everybody gets to see how they're living, and it to me it's it's kind of shining light on how abnormal I guess that is because right. everybody is just so fascinated by how they're living and their training, and I'm like, man. Yeah, it's rough how they're living, but it's, like, not anything that's super abnormal to me. But it turns out it really is. Yeah, yeah. I didn't it's some like fascinating hear stories shit. like that on the West Coast, man. I didn't know people lived at the gym. Like, I didn't know that was a thing either. Yeah, you didn't have, like, people, like, living out. But, like, on the West Coast, I feel like people live in, like, huts and shit out in the woods. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, like, you get down in California, they're on the beach somewhere, I guess. But. Yeah. So how different is the West Coast? It's wild. I yeah. Mean, I mean, and not, like, in a, in a crazy gangster way or anything like that. I mean, yeah. It's very fast-paced. It's very expensive, mm -hmm. you know. It, it, it's pretty much that California syndrome is that there are people from California moved everywhere, and driven prices up everywhere. And yeah, it's just, I don't know. I don't like the pace of life. I don't like you know when I, I was doing undergrad in L.A. and when I went back to Oregon, I was like, man, finally a place I can afford to live, and I'm paying eleven hundred for a one bedroom apartment. Oh god, and, you know, there's Travis taking me three hours to go fifty miles because of traffic and. When it gets to that point, that's one of the things I love about out here is I mean, yeah. we don't have traffic. Dude, that's the best know? part. It really puts it in perspective. I've only been to the West Coast like a handful of times. I think I went to uh, I went to San Diego, L.A., and then San Francisco. So each of those one time. And uh, it's definitely a whole different world. Yeah, but they're beautiful and great mm -hmm. to visit. Mm -hmm. Like I lived in San Diego. I've lived in L.A. I haven't lived in San Francisco. But, you know, there was fun at the time when I was young. Yeah. You wouldn't catch me doing it ever again. Yeah. How old were you when you lived there? Uh, I moved to San Diego in 08. Okay. Um, so it was like 27 or Yeah, something. so it's like 13 years ago. Yeah, it's like 27, yeah. so late And 20s. then I did my undergrad there 2011, so. Okay. And you're from Oregon? Yeah. Okay, so Oregon migrated down to so Southern California. Yeah, and then back to Oregon. Back to Oregon. Okay, and you're going to school, you said undergrad in, in LA? Yeah, and okay. then I did graduate school back in Oregon. Okay, okay. So at what point in time... Like, you're, you're going to school. Were you, like, living, like, fucking crazy rowdy during that time? I'm trying to get a timeline right. is what I'm trying to do. Because yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the listeners, again, we were talking about it off air, right? Like, I saw that, that article that you shared where it's like, you were, like, in a high-speed chase, right? And, right. Like, you, so you had gotten in some trouble, like, living, like, a crazy, wild life of a young man. Right. Right? Yeah. Tell me about that time. Okay. Yeah, Please. Because school came after that. Yeah. So, that, so that's that what I figured. Like, catapult me into school. Into school. Okay. Pause real quick. I need to grab one thing. I didn't grab it. Give cool. me one second. We'll no be... problem. All right, we're back. Yes, yes, yes. All right, I had to grab some papers yeah. for the listeners. Shout out to Hand Wraps. Hand Wraps Rolling Papers, the homie Justin Bricker. 
out here trying to do his thing. He's a part of the uh, of uh, Team Voggy. I thought so because I've seen some rash guards or something with his logo on it, right? Or... Yeah, man, he's doing a good job. He's one of the best salesmen I know. And uh, this was such a good idea. I really, I'm, I'm really glad he's he's like doing his thing, trying to trying to build this company, dude. So shout out to them. Shout out to Unavia Tequila. It's the biz. Yeah, man, they're really cool, man. I've like um, the owners. One of them is his name is Zach Conley. He lives out in like Win- I think he's from Wentzville, Missouri. Um, so just west of here, and his business partner is uh, his name is Bryce. And Bryce, I'm fucking up your last name, buddy. I'm sorry, but either way. He's from Kansas, Midwest guy. So, like, they, they went down to, like, Mexico and found the manufacturer and, like, did the whole thing. So, it's pretty cool. I really I really like that tequila. Um, into your story, sir. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I've got an identical twin brother, and we've pretty much, like, done everything together, right? Yes. And, and it's relevant in the fact that he's involved in most of these stories. <laughs> um, but, like, we when, when growing up, we, like, we were in such competitive sports. Like, we went to different high schools so that we wouldn't wrestle at the same weight class or we wouldn't have to, like, compete against each other. Because you're the same size. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Not so much Well, well then. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, and, and because we were twins, I think our parents wanted us to have our own friend group and stuff, but it never worked out. Really? You know? So they chose to put you guys in different schools just so you guys could, like, be independent yeah. of each other. Great study, but it didn't work. Like we still had all the same friends. That's you know? certainly an experiment, right? For sure. Holy cow! But we got into like the same stuff together. We got into punk rock together. Like we got really into like the anti-racist skinhead scene, and we did all. I like, grew up kind of in like that gang style of punk rock, hardcore type okay. of stuff. You, know? you guys were like like the shit kicking boots. Yo, yeah, Doc Martin. Yeah, 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 bro. It was really heads. really big in in Oregon, especially in Portland at the time. Was like the racist versus anti-racist skinheads. And, okay, and this yeah. is like pre. Any of the stuff that's going on now, pre Antifa, like, yeah, there was no was politics it, aside from it. We just go out and smash each other. It was a know? different time. Yeah, I remember being a kid here in like the Midwest of Missouri, and you kind of see stuff about that on TV and the news yeah, and like stuff. Yeah, like the '90s, it was kind of a popular thing. It was like a popular thing to cover, and you just have such a, a misunderstanding. Like as an adult, you kind of have a more of an understanding of people and kids and how people are. But I remember as a kid thinking, like, man, that's some scary shit. Like you don't know who is who. Right. <laughs> And it's funny, are, too, looking back now is where life is, right? Now I'm a social worker, and I'm like, man, look, I was making social stances back then without even realizing it. Right, you know? yeah. yeah. Like, I like, was very invested in anti-racism, so much that I was very violent about it. You, know? <laughs> you just did it um, in a different way. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's a trip. But that kind of led us into different things. And in uh, 2007, my brother and I started the first chapter of a motorcycle club in Oregon that hadn't been there before. Okay. And where it kind of got sketchy was um, the media made it a big, big deal, right? Mm-hmm. And like they do in a lot of places, it's, oh, hey, the existing club doesn't want the new out-of-state club here, and there's going to be this war. So they oh, had, they had the everyone hyped sells. up. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually um, – I sat down with the paper to do the interview, and they took a picture of the back of my head. Mm-hmm. And it's like – that was like the famous – head tattoo from our club now like really from that one picture it's been used for everything we started a chapter in australia it's my head we started a chapter in canada was my head like, holy shit yeah. how does that feel to I, be... I wish i got paid for it how many times they use it yeah like a licensing deal yeah. or something <laughs> but it's cool too you know i mean it's a it's a well-known tattoo from a, just a one moment your tattoo will live on forever yeah forever like if you google our club name that's the first thing that pops up is that picture of my head that is so cool yeah <laughs> that's rad dude um but yeah so with this newspaper article had come out mm-hmm. And pretty much was pitting us against this other club. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was front page of the paper. So wrestling coach sees it. Mom sees it. It's Things are getting tense. You right? guys are in high school at this point. No, this was 07. So I'm, I'm like 26. Okay. Okay. Um, but, you know, small. You know, we all grew up together. Oh, yeah. Same seven, type of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so everyone is starting to see what's going on. Now I'm getting a lot of pressure about how much danger is going on, like how serious things are. Mm-hmm. So everyone's on high alert. Okay. Well, my parents live on a, a 140 acres and they had two houses out there. A little one me and my brother lived at and then they lived up. Have the bigger house. Oh man, you've had a very interesting. So you live. Right. <laughs> you had your own quarters. Yeah, it was sick. That's sick as hell. So, so but I, I mean, like super private property, like middle of nowhere type mm-hmm. deal. You can get that picture, right? Yeah. And the driveway up to the house is about a half a mile. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm coming down the driveway in a pickup truck, and an all black SUV is coming up the driveway. And when they see me, they freeze. And you know, people get lost from time to time. So that was my first kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I noticed they'd like. Anytime I'd get closer, they'd back away. They were, like, shielding their faces. They were just mm. acting sketchy, right? Yeah. Like, they're not supposed to be there anyway, right? right. It's private property. Yeah, they passed three private no, no trespassing signs to get there. So alarm bells are going off. So I'm watching them, and they turn around finally, and we come to the end of the lane, and I needed to go left and head north, and they were turning right. Mm-hmm. And this was one of those moments that I'll always remember in my life where I looked back and go, am I going to wish I should have stuck with my plan and went left? 
Mm. And I was like, I better go right. I better follow these guys. Yeah. So I'm following them. We're going through town. You know, they're looking back, but their windows are tinted, but they're like hiding. They're just acting suspect, right? Uh Then they get on the interstate and they'd been heading south. Now they're heading north. So now it's like, oh, more alarm bells. So I keep following them. Okay. So I I followed them by now probably 20 miles. Anytime I try and get next to them, they would speed up, slow down. Like it was obvious, like cat and mouse chase. Are you in a car or a bike? Yeah, I'm in a truck. You're in a truck? And I'm by myself. What's going through your mind as you're chasing these guys? At the time, I was just, at first, I was like, maybe they're lost. And then the way they were acting, I was like, no, they're definitely out here for something. Yeah. So then I start thinking bad guys, right? Yeah, and you're like, I can't let these guys get away. Well, my concern was, yeah, that the, well, now I was supposed to be heading to Portland, which was north anyways. So okay. at this time, hey, we're heading the same direction. I'm going to f- see who it is. Two birds of one stone. Right. You yeah. know, okay, I'll follow them for a little bit. I'm probably being o- over dramatic. They're going to peel off. No big deal. Yeah. Well, what they did is they took an exit, and I know right off that exit is the other club that we weren't getting along with Clubhouse. Oh, okay. So that's so like now I'm flag. like, that's okay, now I'm going to follow them. So I follow them, and they go all the way to this other club Clubhouse. They park out front. I go and park down the street, so I'm not by myself. And they roll down the window, and they, like, do one of these waves at me, right? And all I see is a hand. So I'm thinking, okay, now I know what's up. It's these other guys. We got beef. So I start making phone calls. Well, now they get back on the interstate, and they head south. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't want to go back to my house because they know I'm not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So I follow them. Yeah. Followed them for an hour. And as I'm following them, more people kind of jump in on the interstate with me, you know? Your people people Yeah, the people I had called ahead to. Gotcha, gotcha. And it got to the point where as we were coming up on the town of Eugene, uh, Oregon Ducks, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like yeah. big, big town, um, which is an hour south of where I live. So I mean, okay. we've been on the road for a while now. Nike's in Eugene, right? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm finally like, hey, I, we need to see who these guys are. They're not letting us get next to them. I'm like, fuck it. We're going to pull them over. Okay. <laughs> so we get, I get behind them. Another guy gets in front of them, slows down, and yeah, then a guy came them. up next to him. But the guy that came up next to him swerved at him and frightened mm. him. Well, when they got scared, they hit a siren. Now, I was so convinced that these were enemies, that when I heard a siren, I'm looking in my mirrors, right? Oh, shit. Oh, my God, where the hell is this? Where, what's going on it's here? It's not from that. Yeah. <laughs> and so then they smashed all the way over in a pretty evasive move to start taking an exit, and one of the guys tried to cut him off, and then he hit his lights. Mm. And when he hit his lights, I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. You know? like but this but I also was like, hey, I haven't done anything wrong whatsoever, right? Yeah. That I knew of. Yeah. So I started using my – I can tell they wanted me, right? Everyone else took off. Okay. But they're in front of me. So I'm using my turn signals to show that I'm going to go into this parking lot and I guess see what happens. Yeah. So I go into a parking lot. I sit there. I look in my rear view and I realize there's about 30 cops around me, guns drawn. Um, you know, my dumb ass is wearing like leather gloves and shit because I, I didn't know what was going to happen. You're ready. Initially. Yeah. You got to protect your hands. And now I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm about to get wrecked. Like oh, this is shit. all bad. Wow. So they pull me out of the car and, and, and kind of the funny part is that it was an ATF agent and an undercover detective that were in the car. Okay. That's supposedly why they didn't want me to see their, who they were. Mm. So the ATF agent comes up to me, and ter- this comes out in discovery and trial later, but the cop says, hey, hit the radio or, uh, the microphone's recording. So he goes and he turns the music up. Now, all he's saying to me is, man, what a misunderstanding. Not a big deal. We're going to cut you guys loose pretty soon. Um, you know, I don't see that they're going to hold you for anything. No big deal. Uh-huh. Now, in trial, he's saying... This was when I was yelling at him because I was in fear for my life. All this crazy stuff. Oh, wow. And what they did is they put cars in front and behind me and they escorted me to jail and ended up being uh, initially was charged with conspiracy to commit kidnapping and attempted kidnapping because they were forced over a lane. Right. Yeah. You had control of that situation there. Yeah. Wow. So I went to jail thinking I'll be out in the morning. What could I possibly get in trouble for? Right. And they hit. They tried. To oh, hit man. You I went down to court the next day and my co-defendants are there and they both are like pale white like they saw a ghost and we're all separated and they slide this paperwork under my door and I picked it up and I said, Went, fuck. Fuck. <laughs> Fourteen dude. million dollar bail. Whoa. Was on like every news station. Yeah, I, I saw what you shared. I'm like, this is like major news coverage yeah, here. Because the, the headline was bikers trying to run cops off the road. Right. Which that's just yeah, that's not necessarily at all what happened. Clickbait, but like, like for none sure. Other. Yeah, that's the problem, man. You don't ever get the context. Right. Right. They're just trying to sell papers. Wow, dude. And so and so now did they have a warrant to be on your property? So they're no. they're trespassing at that they point, were, right? But the judge ruled and, we weren't allowed to call them trespassers in trial because that might uh favor the jury into thinking that they shouldn't have been there, I suppose. Yeah. But they shouldn't have. You right. Know? Yeah, I mean, they said they were just trying to figure out where I lived, and they got lost by happenstance. And hmm. they also said by happenstance they turned around by that other club's clubhouse. Like they weren't going to admit to what they did, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it was. It sounds like 
okay, so you're, you're trespassing, you're on some place you're not supposed to be. And then you very deliberately went to a location that would leave, you know, the party to believe something, right? They, right. they wanted you to believe they they're they're painting the picture. Yeah, I played right into it. Oh wow, dude. Yeah, you're yeah. like they got you fired the fuck up, bro. They did. Whoa, dude. So yeah, so I sat in jail for over two months fighting it because I, I did have a bail reduction hearing, but the lowest it went was one point five mil. Wow. Um, you had to pay ten percent of that, right? Yeah. Which is what, hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Yeah, I want, oh. no one in my family has that, you know? Yeah. Um so, so I, I sat there and actually so I was in twenty three and a half hour a day lockdown for two months. So oh. I, I fed in my cell, single cell, like I would get out for quick shower or phone call and walk, quick walk through the day room and back and it got bad enough where i started thinking about taking a plea bargain because i was like man prison will be better than this i gotta get out of here i've heard that before where where the holding process is just so bad people are like let me just say whatever i can to get so much so where i think i've seen something where people will commit or will admit to like murders just to get out of the whole right. s- so they can just get on the death row because they know living there is going to be better well in, in prison you know you're not locked in your cell the whole time you've got you know you can get a job you play a guitar you can work out depending on what prison you go to right mm-hmm. there's different stuff we're yeah. here i'm locked up the whole time single cell by myself what's the, going the, through the your pl- mind the plea bargain was two years and i kept thinking well two years isn't bad but man i'm such thick-headed that i was like i didn't do anything wrong i'm mm-hmm. not gonna plead guilty right which a lot of people might have just thought, like, oh, I'm so screwed, I'm trapped. Yeah, my co-defendants did. They both they both pled guilty, and, and because they didn't have criminal records, they kind of got slapped on the wrist and some probation. Uh-huh. Uh, but they were out right out the gate, I and mean, they took plea bargains pretty quick. And you fought it. I, yeah, I stayed in jail, fought it, took it to a jury trial. It was ended up being almost a week-long trial, man. It was like that and alone's a wild experience. Like, you know, you're shackled, and then change you put on a suit and then they move the jury so they don't see you in shackles and you're in you know yeah ankle cuffs and handcuffs and there's a whole process right every, every single day cameras reporters shit yeah like that. and you know typical um small town or being happy that they had like bikers in their crosshairs type of deal they made it a big big deal every time so yeah only x ex- they had extra cops in the courtroom all the time because you know what if they try and break mooch out or like right. crazy stuff that yeah, was never just, gonna happen this whole story they had one story um during the day room one day we were out and they locked down the whole jail. And I remember saying, hey, watch, they're going to try and blame you for that. And I was like, for a lockdown? How how they do that? Sure as shit, go to court the next day. And they said that they had intelligence that the club was going to try and break me out of jail, which, as far as I know, has never happened in the history of <laughs> at least our club. I don't even know how you go about doing that shit. No, and, man, I'm I'm going to trial. I haven't been convicted of anything. Where am I going to go? You yeah. Know? Yeah. But be, they justified that to freak out the, the jury, mm-hmm. and they just had tons and tons of cops in the courtroom after that. That that seems like a form of of jury like a form of jury tampering. Yeah, you would think, right? Like you're manipulating the. It, it'd be almost as if it, on the opposite of that situation is if you had, you know, your your entire club in there and everybody is just like standing in the fucking back of the courtroom, just watching. Right. Like very intently on the jury, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, which like, we wouldn't do. Right, right, right exactly. But it, it, you know, what I'm saying it's like, but when you do it in the the opposite side, where it's all the police. Yeah, they're allowed to do it. Right, and now it's like now that paints a, a different picture, and it's like you know what you're doing. Yep. Yeah, we can only have X amount of people from the club there. Um, you know, no, I don't let anyone wear their club stuff in there for that reason. Everyone would be as well dressed and supportive. Right. Um. But, yeah, so, so I took it all to trial, and I, I was found not guilty of all the felony charges. I was found guilty of reckless driving, which was a misdemeanor, and reckless endangerment, which was a misdemeanor. Oh, okay. Um, which is awesome, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but the, the judge didn't like me, and it was up to her to sentence me. So she gave me the, the state maximum she could give me, which was a year in county jail and then five years of supervised gang probation. Oh, shit. And one of those stipulations was I couldn't hang out with the club. Like It's a non-association clause. Right? Yeah. Dude, probation is such a scam. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's It it doesn't – because our, our justice system, once you get into it, it's it's just a mill. It's, it's meant to keep you in it. Yep. You know what I mean? Like once you're on probation, it's so easy to violate probation, and it's literally at the at the discretion of your probation officer. If if you piss and, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? But it's like maybe your your probation officer gets a hair up their ass, and they could probably find a reason that you just busted probation. Easy. So, it would be easy for me because I'm not allowed to hang out at the club, and that included my twin brother. And so we had you go to Thanksgiving, and, and you just and you just broke the rules. That was an argument, right? So we <clears throat> we actually fought back against it, and I lost. 
Wow. Because the judge said, finally, her kind of like half middle ground was if it was a specific holiday that we were going to be supervised by parents, like some mm. ridiculous, like that we weren't out sitting around plotting gang stuff <laughs> or whatever <laughs> crazy things they think we were doing. Yeah. What was really wild is when I, so I, when I got found not guilty, it's a pretty big deal, right? Uh-huh. But I was still sentenced to a year in jail, so I had to go back. You know, I was going, getting transported back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I saw the smoke. I'm blowing. No, no, I'm just battling this cold. Mm. Um, but this was like out of the movies, man. And it, and it was a trip. Is they put me into a squad car mm-hmm. with a bulletproof vest on. Then they had a squad car behind me and two in front of me. And they went. We went down to this tunnel. And then got out of the cars and had to go through this tunnel and came up in a different parking garage and then taken back like this this then this big like profile you know what i mean like a big deal yeah and remember like thinking, the whole man, scene yeah and i was thinking hey you know we've come and left this courthouse a hundred times in the last week mm-hmm. why is this one different and they go oh well we were worried you were getting sentenced to prison and we thought you guys they might try and break you out so they had this like conceived crazy plan right that was so important that yeah. they're gonna do some wild stuff to bust me out for a year in county i said i told the guard i was like you know i only got a year right yeah it's like wh- why would why would i risk everything just to evade right. one I just won. Year. I yeah. just won my trial. In my opinion, I won. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I like guess it sucks you're, you're going away for a year, but hey, it's, it's only a year. In right. The grand scheme. Well, and the beauty of it was, which I had known this, is, you know, this was like a huge political issue at the time, how overcrowded all the jails were. There was no room. Yeah. And they were they were going to use me as, as a, a pawn to show, hey, we got to let this big bad guy go because essentially they have a rating system in jail. Like, what are his charges? Mm-hmm. Is he violent? Is it bad for the community? Well, I'm in there on a driving charge, right? Yeah. So they put me into the sentencing matrix that they call it. Okay. And I'm at the very bottom of the priority. So. Out of my year, I'd done those first two and a half months. Uh-huh. I did one more day, and then they kicked me out, and I had to do a month of work crew, like eight hours a day, five days a week, show up and report and do work crew. Oh, nice. And then that was it. So it was your two year, your two months already time served yeah. plus the day, and then now you did work. Right. And then plus the five years. And that's of the probation. funny part. There was you know, always some sort of haters or shit talkers, right? They're like, oh, he only did a day. What did he, what did he do? Hey, listen, I already got found guilty and not guilty, right? Right. There was nothing to do. Right. And the fact was I was in being held in jail on yeah. a misdemeanor charge. Right. In overcrowded jail. Right. And they just didn't have room for me, like period. And how about the fact that you just sat in solitary for 23 and a half hours a day for two months? Yeah. What about that? <laughs> and I kept doing it. So Jesus that, that's the Christ. frustrating part. So I get out of jail. I realize I'm going to have a really hard time not hanging out with my brother in the club. Yeah. So um, misdemeanor charges, I start looking into it. They can't extradite if I go to a different state. So I said, F it, and I moved to San Diego, which is when I lived in San Diego. Nice. And that's when you started going to school. Not yet. No, that was L.A. Yeah. Got it. So I was down in San Diego. I was working for a tattoo shop, hanging out at the club, just kind of trying to get my shit together after just getting out of jail. Yeah. You know what I mean? Were you tattooing or were you like an apprentice? No, yeah, I was cleaning and like learning how to pierce, just basic stuff, getting paid cash to kick Mm -hmm. it. You know, yeah, I lived close to the beach. It was, it was a good time. Were you already pretty inked up by this time? Yeah, yeah. When did you start really getting the tattoos? 16 was my first one. First I remember one? on my wrestling team, we had to cover them up because it was like they weren't popular yet. You okay. Know? And so a coach would make us like ace bandage over them. Or yeah. Whatever. And by this time, so you're already, so how long, are you pretty much completely covered? Yeah, my legs are still relatively open, some low back, a little bit of ribs, but yeah, I mean. But like arms, all like all, yeah, yeah. obviously all this, right? So how yeah. long did that process take for you? I'm 40, and I started at 16, so, you know. You're still getting weird. tattoos? Yeah, not a, not as much, I don't like them. It right, now. so you, you did like a, there was there a period where you did like a bulk of the work? Probably in my early 20s, man, yeah. for sure, yeah. Oh, man, what did it feel like getting your head tattooed? Terrible. Really? It was worse. I bet I get asked that question almost daily. I'm sure you do. And, uh absolutely insane how bad it hurts really yeah i mean it's the type of pain where obviously you can sit there and deal with it mm-hmm. but it's not pleasant the vibrations going through your brain right like yeah it's it, your whole head's it, on fire wow. it sucks the only the ones i will say this though like chest and other places will still hurt mm-hmm. the whole rest of the day mm-hmm. the minute he stops tattooing my head it doesn't hurt anymore really but it's while he's doing it it's mm-hmm. terrible what are you thinking when he's doing it oh, man i try and like zone out I yeah i focus on breathing just yeah like Find some sort of weird zen so that I can, like, not focus on the pain. Yeah. I try to do the same. I just breathe. I just try to focus on a spot. Or I just tell myself, I'm like, all right, this hurts really fucking bad, but it's only temporary. I'm like, this pain is temporary. This tattoo is going to be badass forever. Right. <laughs> like, and I know me. I have a bunch of half-finished tattoos. I'd rather sit there and get them done than right. sit there when I come back. Let's just power through this. Yeah. I always uh, – I always – 
get really uh, bummed out when I'm like, all right, we're, we're almost done. We're, we're going to probably be done with this pretty soon. And then they're like, all right, let, let me just take a break for a second. I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, like, a break? <laughs> and then, and then and it like settles in, like all the pain starts setting in, and they want right. to come like re-agitate yeah, I don't the spot. The I'm just like, bro, let's, let's just, just power through, dude. That's yeah. the worst. Holy shit. The worst is like when he says you're almost done. Yeah. So then you're like sitting there counting the seconds, and he's still wiping. Yeah. Still wiping. Pencil. Yes. Oh, terrible. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, I digress. Yeah. Right? So you're in San Diego. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in San Diego. It's Tattoo probably parlor. it's probably only there six months. Okay. And our club got hit with a national wide raid. It was an Operation Black Raid. And it was like a, the biggest federal investigation of a motorcycle club ever, I think. Really, dude. You know the only <laughs> so the first thing that comes to mind anymore these days is probably for a lot of people is is what you think what you see on TV, right? Which is fucking you know Sons of Anarchy, right? <laughs> it's like. I, I I watched that whole show and it's like this whole Rico case that they had in the show, and that's such an interesting concept where you can just but like you can send a whole bunch of people to jail with like no real like physical evidence. That's a fact. Only just suspicion and 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 or, like or they'll have a predicate crime based off one of two individuals. Yeah, and then you but just that link, somehow overlaps to everybody. Yeah, and you're like, well, you guys are all friends, right? So it's just so fascinating right. to see that, and it's like, but that's real life shit. Like that was developed for a purpose because you didn't actually have evidence. Yep, and that's the purpose now, right? So you can take it and fight it in trial and look at 15 years to life, or sign this piece of paper that you did it and we'll give you six months or a couple guys a couple years. Take your plea bargain and go home. So they have this high conviction rate because who's going to fight that? Yeah. Because so, say you're going to fight out the Rico, but I did some heinous shit. Well, they're going to bring up what I did in your trial because you're fate. You're going to be there for everybody's stuff, right? Yeah. Like, how are you supposed to beat that? That's wild shit, so man. So they just force everyone into these, you know, trumped up plea bargains. And that's like, and that's how they hit everybody at once, like across like a, yeah. like the nation. Yeah. So they hit like every state and. I don't know. We can get super sidetracked on that, but the point was my whole chapter got busted, uh -huh. and now I'm down there by myself. Gotcha. Riding solo. Yeah. So I, I came back home, turned myself in, went back to jail for two months. Two months. Um, and that time was kind of funny, is they put an informant in there with me, a guy that used to be in our club that we didn't know who's an informant at the time, but looking mm. back was probably pretty obvious. And, uh, <laughs> Hindsight's always 20 Yeah, and so he's in the cell next to me, and I'm like, oh, familiar face, cool. And I kind of told him my game plan was. My game plan was I hope I get violated. Hope, and the judge says, you're going to jail for the year, and then I get out without probation anymore. Because mm -hmm. I know I'm going to keep going back and forth otherwise. Yeah, so if you so if you, if you you get – so if you violate parole and you go and you serve X amount of time, now it's – you're just done, time served, yeah, no more probation? Yeah, you, you can go back for the remainder of your sentence or even the remainder of your probation, but then you will come out without probation, right? Got it. And now I know the jails are full. I know that I'm there for misdemeanors. How long can I really do? Yeah. Instead of keep going back and forth. Right. That makes sense. It's like, let's just get this shit I done I thought with. so. Yeah. I didn't. No, the judge <laughs> told and it came out in court that you know this informant had all this valuable information and that was it and uh so she violated me one count at a time Ooh. i had like five counts right so i would have had to have gone through that process five or six times damn and i think i did it three every t i violated three or four different times for hanging out at the club went back to jail and did a month to two months every time so i mean i still ended up doing damn near my year yeah but it Shit, was just like over, incrementally yeah it was over the count several years oh my goodness but that's what got me into school so yeah Man, I came back one day, and the guard pulls me aside, and he says, man, we actually had a bet whether you'd be back or not. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, trying to be tough guy. like." Yeah. And he, and he goes, man, look around here. You know, he goes, do you fit in? And, you know, respectfully, but there's people in there dealing with, you know, homelessness, and drug addiction, and mental health, and all these people that I didn't feel were my people, mm -hmm. right? And I remember looking around thinking, no, this isn't for me. This isn't where I want to be. And I just felt really low. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just felt really bad about myself. I was like, man, this isn't the legacy I want to leave. This isn't how I want to be remembered. In and out of jail my whole life, like, this isn't the life I want to lead. Right. And that's when I was like, well, I got to do something. Yeah, that makes sense, man. And so you're, you're 26, 27 around this time, right? Yep. So it's interesting. Did you, around that time, did you notice a, a, a difference in the way in which you were kind of, like, thinking about things as a whole? Like, like you're, yeah. you're, like, you started to perceive the world a little bit differently around that time? I would say it was probably closer to my 30s before I wrapped that up. But a lot of it was because of distractions I had from other stuff. Oh, okay. You know, I'm young leadership in this club, and I'm, like, trying to fill that role and yeah. do these different things. And right, I'm still man. learning a, a new name and a new reputation and a whole new world. You're like a young man trying to figure his right. place out so, in the yeah, world, man. So I, I, I was still kind of going then versus 
when I finally got settled in and, oh. and, and life really hit me. Yeah. You know? And the reason I ask is because, and I, I fucking harp on this all the time. I always talk about how, um, you know, typically, uh, you know, the, the human brain kind of like starts fully developed. It's like fully developed around like 25 yep. typically. Right. Yep. So, and I've even noticed like in my like with me and like, especially my little brother and you kind of see across the board, um, usually around like 25, 26, you know, you kind of start, you know, your brain's fully developed. You start thinking a little bit differently. You kind of start becoming more of an, like an adult. You have like more right. of an adult mind. Long-term planning, action right. consequences, all those parts. You know, you have, up, you, you have know. this understanding, right? So all of that shit. So I'm, I guess that's why I'm just thinking. It's like, so it's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like, I wonder if it's like, oh man, your brain just kind of turned a corner. And then now you just had this conversation. And it sounds like now you're actually able to receive that message right. as opposed to maybe if you had that conversation when you're like 24, you're like, get the fuck out of here, dude. Right. For sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like, man, it's like the mind is such an interesting thing because I always think about how in, in, we don't have to go deep into this, but we were kind of like talking a little bit about like the Rittenhouse case and shit like that. How like kids, you know, when you're, you're like 18 years old, you, you graduate school you're 17, 18, you graduate school, you go into the world, you're considered adult by society, um, you can vote, you can go join the military, you can go get a job, you can go do all these things, right? But really, it's like, yes, like physically, you, you, you I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty much grown, but even then, you're still physically developing for quite some time. Like, at the end of the day, you're not really an adult. You're not really right. grown. You're still you a fucking... You have no idea what you're doing. You're a fucking kid still. Yeah. You're still a child at 18. You know what I'm saying? No direction. No, no idea what you're doing. You don't know who Poor you are. Choices. Exactly. Yeah. You don't know who you are. You're fucking... You're, you're irrational. Uh, you just... You just fucking... You just think for the now. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, there's no long-term planning. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's hard most to, of my 20s. It's hard to have any empathy. And you know, it varies, but usually around like the late 20s, you kind of start yep. thinking a little bit differently, hopefully. Uh, so it's just like, man... Just the idea, I always, and this is like bigger picture shit, I was like, man, sometimes like I understand how it's like, all right, you're 18, you can make decisions, you can do this thing. And it's like, man, if you make bad choices, like you need, you need to be held responsible. There's consequences for choices. But sometimes I'm like, man, we completely ruin people's lives because of whenever they were like this irrational creature. Like, like young boys between like 18 and like 25, they're they're pretty dangerous creatures right. right in history because you're full of testosterone and ego and like all of this shit right which a lot of great things have been built off of that shit right like this way of empires and all this crazy shit right in inventions all this stuff so it's just it just blows me away like how how if somebody just maybe is who knows what the circumstances are, but you just make some decisions and you get in trouble or whatnot. And then now that can affect your entire life. Even after you've either like served time and, 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 and maybe, you know, you've grown, you've learned from it. You think different. Like right. you, you see like 40 year old men in prison who got in trouble when they were like 18, 19, 20, like they, maybe they robbed somebody because they were desperate or some shit. And it's right. like, now you're going to shake the stigma. Yeah. Or and get out of that circle. Yeah. Or you can't break the cycle. Like you can't get like you're on probation or, you know, now once you're a felon, now you can't get jobs. You can't vote. I mean, you're just a slave yep. again at that point. So it just blows my mind. Yeah. Well, and that, that's kind of the crossroad I was at. So I, I got a felony when I was 18 for a fight after high school or was in high school, but it was an after school fight. Uh -huh. And the very short version is I had to do with a bottle. So it was a pretty heavy felony charge and uh, I took a plea bargain and I got a felony. Okay. Okay. So I've had that since a month after turning 18. It's been on my record. Yeah. I still have it to this day. And so here I am thinking, okay, I know I'm better than going in and out of jail, but what can I do with myself? I've got my head and face tattooed. I'm a felon. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, you make a whole bunch of choices. Yeah. Based off a, 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 like an ability to think long term. Yeah. And it, and it just is what it is. Like, that's the human experience. But like, what are you going to do now? Yeah. And, and that's kind of where I was at. What really pulled me out of it is there's a, a member of this club that's his PhD in clinical psychology. And if you saw him, you would have no idea. He's got more tattoos than me. Mm -hmm. you know, long hair, rings everywhere. I mean, he's <laughs> placed apart, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, well, hell, man, if he can do it, I can do it. He looks crazier than I look. Uh -huh. You know, and I've always been into like, I told you, like the kind of social work and helping people. My whole, my whole family is uh, teachers. My twin brother owns an adult uh, foster care home for oh. um you know, adults with developmental disabilities. Oh, right. So we've kind of always had that like helping aspect. Very nurturing, protective. Yeah. Very protective. So what did you get your undergrad in? 
Well, I started at community college for my uh, CDAC, so my Certificate for Drug and Alcohol Counseling. Okay. And I liked it, but it wasn't like my calling, you know? I got really into psychology. Mm. I got my undergrad in psychology and social behavioral studies. Okay. So, yeah, you completely – like, I'm trying to explain to the fucking guy who understands the brain. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, like... but that's why I get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then my master's degree I got in social work. Okay. Okay. And so you went to L.A. for your master's degree? Uh, Oregon. I Oregon George for George Fox master's. University. Okay, did, sorry. Uh, Whittier College for my undergrad. Okay, gotcha. So, so then – I mean, you get your degree and then what? Like, what's your plan? Right. Well, that's why I didn't know. That, right? <laughs> and that's kind of what ends up bringing me here is so um, I'm finishing up my master's degree. Mm-hmm. I was getting really into working out at the time and I was feeling good. And I started, but like we were talking, I miss that like team or like just the challenging myself, right? Yeah. And my friends were trying to get me to try jujitsu, but since I'm that arrogant guy, I was like, oh, that's your thing. I'm going to try something else. I was yeah. trying to find all these different things, and I found the Krav Maga gym. Okay. And I was like, oh, this could be cool, right? I've heard cool things. I didn't know anything about it, but, okay. you know, it's one of those martial arts you hear about. So I was like, oh, that should be neat. They talk it up very well, yeah. too, right? It's like you're using elbows and knees. Yeah, and it sounds really It's cool. all about damage. Yeah. So uh, I meet with the instructor, and she was super cool, and I did a class, and it was fun. And I remember leaving there, which is – that good mental health space, right? Like, yeah. I struggle with depression. I think a lot of people do. And the mm-hmm. one thing that really helps me is exercise, you know? So Absolutely. I remember leaving there just amped, you know? Probably. I was punching things. I was moving around. I Absolutely. felt young again. A lot of benefits to it, right? You found right. some community. And at the end of the day, some of those techniques are going to work, right? right? And if you are going to learn something to fight, I mean, shit, it's not the worst thing. Right. right. And right. I was just moving. I was having fun. Having and fun. So I, I was coming back and I was telling uh, my wife, Ashley, how much I liked it, how amped I was. And so she was excited that I was excited. And the next day, the um, instructor calls me and tells me I can't come to class anymore. Really? Turns out, you know, there's a bunch of law enforcement that train that martial art, which whatever. But because my crime was against cops, they hate me, right? Oh, wow. Which to me, I think is a weird, and, and we could talk about this with jujitsu related too. It's, it's a weird uh, perspective to come from because he, here's my thing. Say I don't like you and you start coming to my gym. Yeah. What's the best chance to get to know you, right? Yeah. A, if you've been doing it and I'm not, I'm the beat the hell out of me i guess yeah that was my thing i was like i guess i'm getting beat up by cops the rest of the time i go here right you sure. know? get your licks in get your right licks here in or try and get to know the guy right right but the whole hey he can't come here is something i can never really understand it's very close-minded so they told her they were going to go to the police union if she let me come so that put her in a bad spot it's her business and she was very upfront and cool about it and i hold no grudges but i was asked not to come back mm. and that's when i was like well i guess i'll try jujitsu okay um, and I went to the local jiu-jitsu academy, and the head coach was a guy I grew up wrestling with. He was on the wrestling team a couple years younger than me. We had some history. We used to box together. And so I was like, oh, shit, Nick does this? Oh, you know? so, so you grew up doing a ton of different sports, right? You said you – Yeah, I only boxed for a minute. I mainly grew up wrestling. I mean, I, Okay, you know, so a, mostly wrestling. Yeah, as a kid, I did all of it, right? Okay, you play uh, like football. And, everything, yeah. Because yeah. like I told you, my parents or family was all teachers, so they're also coaches. Like, okay. I was a track coach, football coach, basketball coach. Oh, so you're a long-time athlete. Yeah, I was never great at any of that stuff, but I did it all. Yeah, you know? that's important, though. Yeah. So, yeah, man, so you've just completely grown up just being in teams. Yep. Yeah. And then add that into, a, you know, a twin trying to find his own identity, and it kind of makes sense. Right? Yeah. Up, you know? <laughs> Shit, man. Yeah, dude, that's cool. So wrestling was your thing, though. Dude, yeah. wrestling changed my whole life. Yeah, me and Jeremy did, my twin brother, we did Matt Club in grade school. We wrestled all through junior high school. We wrestled all through high school. Oh, nice. I lettered every year except for junior year. I got suspended for fighting, so I was <laughs> a semester. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was a big, you know, I, I was back and forth between varsity and JV. I wasn't like an amazing standout wrestler, but I was, you know, was good enough to keep doing it, and yeah. I just really liked it. Yeah. You know? Man, I can dig it. Changed my whole life, dude. Absolutely yeah. love it. My son just started wrestling this week. And uh, so I'm like, I'm helping like, co- he's in eighth grade. So it's like, it's, oh, awesome. it's still the kids club. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited. I think he's going to do really well. I feel like, man, you can be way better than me. My nephew, who this is going to sound terrible, but I want to say he's eight. Uh-huh. Um, he just had a, a tournament this weekend. Okay. He's doing great at it. Oh, he he awesome. lost his first match, but then next two were pins under a minute. Nice. Or, I mean, first round pins. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, he, he did great. Dude, it's so cool. It, it gives it gives kids um, so much confidence and like it just it just teaches them how to just like overcome and like yeah. what it's like to really have like a struggle. Yeah. I mean, that's what jujitsu is for me is once I really got into it and you get in all these hard positions and yes. you want to quit, you want to tap because you're tired or in this bad spot. Yeah. And I think of that when I'm getting tattooed. I think of that when I'm at a, a shitty spot of burnt, lifting weights. Mm-hmm. Like I think, you know, I'm riding in the cold or the rain. Like there's so many moments where I'm like just toughing it out that I learned those moments from jujitsu. Mm, yeah. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? 100%, like, man. Because I had to be there to go, hey, nothing's going to stop until this round's over. Right. Right. Like you're here. 
Yeah, you know, especially at at Pedagos, the the one thing I always tell this to people, the one thing that is is f- different about them compared to a lot of places is that they like they don't stop rolling. Yep. So they if you'll be you'll be rolling off the mat, you'll be rolling on onto another group. Don't stop rolling. It doesn't matter because if you stop rolling, that's when you're either going to get tapped or most likely probably like hurt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're probably gonna, I always remember in football um, the coach would say, "If you're not going full speed, that's probably when you're going to get hurt. It's yep. usually you know you're going slow and something happens." So it, I just apply that to the same. And every time I've typically gotten hurt in like one of those situations, it's where I just kind of like I'm not I'm just not being sharp enough. I'm being a little too lazy, a little too lax. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not it's not like I have to be going full go, but like I'm just not, you know, I'm just sloppy essentially, yeah. right? And then you get fucking hurt. So it's like, man, you need to be on your shit. You can't right. stop rolling. You gotta keep you gotta keep going. Right. So For yeah, sure. you yeah, so you feel that pressure, right? Like those guys just put it on you. If you know, fuck man, you know, everybody else is rolling hard. We got, you know, a three, four, five minute roll, it's like, all right, I gotta go. I gotta go. Yep. I just try to figure out ways to slow it down. That's yeah, it. dude. Yes, they control. Do you try to roll most mostly gi, or do you like yeah, no gi as well? Gi. I mean, almost every time I've been hurt was no gi. Okay, it's a lot of a scrambling and stuff like that. And then now Pulling with on my your current, neck. yeah, with my new injuries, mm-hmm. like, there's no way. I mean, I, I do one day a week no gi. Okay, and so I'm moving around, having some fun, learning some new things. Yeah, but not. I don't roll the same at all. Right. Yeah. Gi is, is it's really nice to be able to to slow down the game. Yeah, I will get my grips, try and get in a good spot, and I'll just yeah. start chilling. You know? Yeah, you get that old man jujitsu. Yeah, I love it. Because yeah. even with those quick youngsters, if I can slow them down, I do okay. Yeah, I just gotta slow them down. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. they're spinning all over me. <laughs> Dude, they're wild. They'll be doing cartwheels and shit yeah. over top of you. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I try. I try not to do that. I find that uh, <clears throat> most like newer people to jujitsu, they almost all kind of play the same game, whether they're young or old, and it's for different reasons. I found like if you're young, you feel like all right, I'm young, I'm uh, athletic, so your idea is I can just be explosive and athletic. I want to show these guys I don't suck. <laughs> yeah, and you can just do things. You're like, all right, well, I'm gonna hit this real hard. I'm a cartwheel, or you're just gonna try to explode into stuff or muscle into stuff. And then if if somebody's maybe like a, they don't have to be that old, but if they, if they feel like they're older, they'll feel like all right, I gotta go really hard so I can keep up with these young guys. And it's not because they feel like they're athletic or anything like that. They just feel like they're they're at a disadvantage because they feel old. Yeah. And then now they end up going crazy hard and they're intense. And it's like, for hey, sure. I need you all just to just relax. That was me before the injury. For right. Sure. Yeah. You, know, you can't breathe. Up. Yeah. You're like holding your breath all tense. Yep. Tight. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everybody goes through the same struggle. I feel, especially wrestlers. Right. Right. Did you just put your head down and just go? I still do. The only thing though, I still get away with it is everyone's scared to grab my neck now. So now. Oh, everybody. Everybody's <laughs> nice to you. Yeah. They're like. Uh, don't. But not before. I was getting loop choked every day. Yeah. 18, yeah. That's so that was funny. like my habit. I still do it. I notice because I always tell my wife that I've got really good skin on my forehead. It, like, <laughs> it just gets rubbed off on geese every day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember coming back, my skin's always all smooth and shiny. I'm like, yeah, because I was digging it in there. That's so funny. It's constantly exfoliated. Yep. From the geese. Oh, my God. Yeah, that is so funny. Yeah, you fuck around and get choked out with your gee real quick. If real you, quick. If you, like, lead with your head. Get guillotined or something. Yep. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've been loop choked a lot. Yeah, yeah, I bet. How long you how so how long have you been at Mount Vernon now? So how okay, let me actually back up. So you started training jujitsu. Yeah. How long are you training jujitsu before you you know, you come across Heath or how right. do you get, you know, connected with Heath and, It was about four months in. So when I probably like most of us, when I got into jujitsu, I was all in. I was no longer lifting weights. I was training three times a day. I was actually, so I was going to graduate school in Portland. Mm-hmm. I'd get up in the morning, drive an hour and a half north, and go train with an old friend of mine that was a brown belt, and he was coaching at, at a different gym. Okay. So drive up there, train with him, go to school, come home, and then go hit night class at Impact. And so at least two times a day, plus we had, um, I got a bunch of guys in, the, in, in my chapter to do it, so we put mats at our clubhouse. So nice. now we're rolling with each other at the clubhouse. So you're training all the time. So, I mean, easily six days a week, two, three times a day. Like you got I was, the bug. I was getting it hard. Yeah, for sure. Um, and right around that time, so same thing. Like, so law enforcement never really dropped the fact that they didn't like me, right? Mm. And, and kind of a funny caveat to that is I went to a thing for show I roll put on up in Portland. I can't remember what they called it, but it was where they like traveled and showed geese and taught some seminars and it was cool, you know, mm. uh, world clan. It was like a world clan thing okay. that they did. So a bunch of guys from different gyms were there and there's cops training. Well, there was a picture of me and my brother and our geese and apparently a cop took a picture of us taking a picture uh-huh. and they put it up at the academy 
and it said, these guys are training, are you? It's like to motivate them. Like, oh, the my bad gosh. guys are getting it, are you? Holy cow. What, but, a, what a motivating message. But that was kind of starting to go through the gym now. And now I knew, like, okay, my coach was cool with it, but the gym owners were kind of weird about it. And I was kind of back in this, is this one of those things where I'm going to get kicked out again? Yeah, you know? yeah, because there's, there's – Quite a bit of law enforcement. Well, yeah, for sure. And, and I'm still very into, like, just getting into the jiu-jitsu scene. I don't understand the politics of it. Uh -huh. Oregon's a lot different than here. Um, so I wasn't confident that they were going to be like, yeah, Justin's cool. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's very still close to home, right? Like, this is the law enforcement, like, in the area. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's very personal, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. You know, and there was a few guys I trained with that were law enforcement that were all nice guys. I mean, talk outside of the gym, but we got along just fine, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but it was, you know, higher ups and you know how that stuff works. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, at the time I just got my very last internship for, to finish my master's degree. And it was like my dream job. I was going to be a counselor for kids at the prison, the kid's prison. Okay. Stoked, right? Killed the interview, was hired. They sent me this address to go for the training. I didn't think anything of it. I show up the first day of training and it's at the police academy. Mm. Yeah, what's that feeling like? <laughs> Man, I drove in there. I'm like, no way. Like, what are the odds? This is the state police academy. So all the counties were there. Every mm. state was there. Everybody. Shit, dude. So I'm trying to always keep myself in check. And I'm thinking, man, you're being way too arrogant. Nobody here knows who you are. You're not that important. You're in a motorcycle club. Like, you're not a kingpin. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. get over yourself. Yeah. So I, like, hype myself up. I start walking through the parking lot. And by chance, the chief state chief of police was walking by me and just mean mugs me the whole way oh wow and i remember texting ashley going that's not gonna be long and I was, <laughs> I was there for one day before they pulled me out of class really and they're like hey are you in this motorcycle club i was like yeah i sure am and here's why i think it's a positive and here's why it doesn't affect my job and you know because I, I don't hide it yeah and uh they were kind of cool we had this back and forth they're like well we're gonna have to you know talk to some people and call you back and then i got fired oh wow well i sued and i won mm. i sued against uh, the whole state against discrimination Oh. Or for discrimination. Oh, wow. Um, I won $1,001, some random monetary $1, amount. $1,001. And it wasn't a paid job, so it wasn't out money. It was the principal. You know, right. So they paid all my attorney fees, and they gave me $1,001. And now here's the thing. Now that sets a precedent. Right. Right? So now it's, it's, it's clear that if they try to do that again in a similar situation to somebody else, they can't do it now. Right. 100%. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to do it because I want to stand up for myself, too. I said, hey, I'm brand new to this field. This is going to come up a lot. Yes. Um. And, like, I'll happily talk about being in this club, but mm -hmm. I'll also tell you why it doesn't affect what I do for a living. Right. In fact, there's certain things that I think, is, like, having the tattoos and stuff like that is almost a benefit for what I do. And you want me to start working with teens? Yeah. Who are they going to relate to? Yeah. You know, the tattooed biker or, you know. They're truly going to believe what you're saying. Like, they, listen, dude, I've lived this. I, I have the perspective, right? Like, here's the, the proof. Like, why would I right. lie to you? And, you know, the whole point of that whole therapeutic rapport is that, People want to be heard, like really heard. They want to know you understand what they're saying. Right. So I never have to tell my story at all. I think they can look at me and say, this guy gets it. Yeah. Like I have that leg up. Yeah. You know? Like that's the energy that you give off. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're so yeah, I mean, it's like, listen, this, this gives me a, a perspective and an ability to connect that others don't. It's a positive, right? right. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I, I sue the state. I'm in all these newspapers. Just finishing school, finding a job's difficult because my face is on all these newspapers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, fuck. All I care about at the time is jujitsu, mm -hmm. and that's when I was like, "Well, hey, I met these dudes in L.A. I'm gonna see what what's up with with Heath." That's so, cool. So yeah. I called Heath and said, yeah. "Hey, what's up out there?" And yeah, cause were, were, they, were they out in L.A. for uh, for like Worlds or something? Yeah, we went down there. So um, I was going back and forth between those two gyms, and then because I was going to California so much for club stuff, I was training with Orlando Sanchez all the time. Okay, and he was like my professor even though that wasn't like my home gym okay. that's who like promoted me to blue belt and stuff like that okay so you weren't like a gracie baja guy but that was your professor just if i trained with him like because yeah we, we just did a ton of privates we do seminars like gotcha. at least once or twice a month i was training with him yeah yeah and you i know, know he took a liking to like andrew wiltsey and he yeah and, yeah and that so i was going down there for worlds brand new man i've been i think i went to worlds i've been training four months but you know i was in my head i'm so hot shit i'm ready going to go home. beating everybody i'm doing great yeah you know? and, uh, <laughs> so i flew down there with nobody and i mean i know the club in town and stuff but man i'm a college student i got no money orlando's supposed to pick me up from the airport i'm gonna go out and stay with him and then train the whole time well he forgot about me so i paid like a hundred dollar uber ride out to, to orlando's house and he wasn't there so i go to the gym and i just start training i take text me he's running late to start training so i'm training and doing pretty good in his room i feel starting to feel real confident and then the daisy fresh dudes walked in hmm. And, you know, I like kind of stand out. Rondo was there. He's being loud, you know. And <laughs> I love Rondo. A group Rondo. of guys, and he's being super nice. And, 
And uh, so right out the gate, I start rolling with Josh Graham. And I remember looking at him thinking, okay, he's smaller than me. I'll probably, you know, he's a white belt. I'm a white belt. Mm-hmm. I was doing real good against the other guys here. Man, I bet he traveled with me six times in one round. Like, really? he manhandled me. He treated me like I was brand new, brand new. <laughs> I mean, I was, but you know what I'm saying? Like, right. Not yeah. like anything. Everything else, I was like, man, I'm rolling really good. I'm going to do good at this tournament. Yeah. He made me was like, man, dude, is jiu-jitsu even for me? It's like a shattered reality type thing. But it was great, too, because I instantly was like, who are these guys? And I want to train with them. Yes. You know, like, these guys are kicking my ass. Get me in on this group, yeah. you know? Well, I think that's the right reaction. Yeah, it was awesome, you know? And then they were just really cool guys. We hung out a lot. So then the next day was a tournament. Orlando didn't show up to it, um, and I didn't have a coach. Mm. So I went up and was talking to Heath, and, and uh, um, Alejandro ended up coaching me. Okay. Who I didn't know, you know what I mean? They were yeah. just helping. Yeah, they're just so always down to help. Yeah, and so I, I linked up with him and Garner and some of the guys from the team that were there, and I spent all day at Worlds with them all night. We went out to dinner together. I didn't have a ride back to Orlando's. Mm. So um, they gave me a ride back, yeah. so we ended up going to dinner. So we just all really clicked and hung out. Yeah, you know? they're, they're, they're just such good – like Heath uh, just gives off such a good energy – and it's it's very like calming and like welcoming. Yeah, and yeah. It, they provided exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. I was training at like three or four different gyms. I didn't feel like any of them was a home gym. Yeah, and then coming from like I said, kind of gang stuff to club stuff, I was looking for like a tight knit community, like a real team. Right. And I saw that with them right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember coming home and telling Ashley like, "That's where I want to be. Those are the guys I want to be with." Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's just everybody just looks out for each other, and I I always like when Heath invites people. Um, to come train because it's always it's literally just like an open invite. There's zero pressure yeah. with it at all. And like, and there's, there's no strings attached. He's like, yeah, man, just come out stay chill. Like train for sure. Like, come out and get better. <laughs> like he loves it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. He definitely just wants to help people, man. Mm-hmm. And that is super apparent right out the gate. Like, right. I never felt bullshitted. I never felt like, what's the benefit of having me on the team? He knows I wasn't coming out there to try and be a world champion. I'm not putting points on the board. Right. But- just coming to hang and be part of the group. He just likes having know? good people around, and you like to help people, right? So yeah, I mean, for that, sure. that immediately aligns with. I mean, I mean, your ethos. Yeah, yeah. I'm honestly, like right out the gate, that's my big part. I feel that's what I bring to the table, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm a good friend to everyone on the team. I'm there for anybody if they ever need anything. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. You yeah, know? man. So, so now, I mean, you you, you moved to Mount Vernon. What was that transition like for you, like here in the Midwest? Because the Midwest is different than the West Coast, bro. Right. <laughs> so I kind of touched on earlier that I used to be in a band, so we traveled a lot. We played all over the country. So I'd like seen clips of the Midwest, but yeah. I spent time in it, right? Yeah. So, oh, dude, yeah, I don't want to gloss over that. What was it like being in a band, dude? It's crazy. It's crazy. You're, you're Imagine like, a bunch of guys, and they're like... You're in a punk band, right? Yeah, we're like early 20s. From the, from the region of punk band right, right? Yeah, you know yeah. what i'm saying you're not like some some midwest people trying to like be a punk band like you're there where like all the punk bands are at <laughs> right yeah and we toured with all like the bigger name punk groups in the 90s you know and uh put an album out on one of rancid's record labels we oh, played wow. like the warp tours and cbgb's like, really all the cool spots yeah we did some really cool shit. So, what's the yeah. name of your band should... it's called the escaped the escaped it's hard to find because it's such a cheesy generic name but bro the escape i posted a bunch of it on instagram yesterday because it's actually on instagram music some of our old songs and i was like whoa sweet so i was like posting clips of them you know how you can like add songs to your stories yeah yeah our, our band has some songs on there so i was like reminiscing and how do those get on there is it just because they're in the, the, the maybe if they're on spotify just or the spotify cause, database cause we, had, we had like three records out on actual record labels so they had distribution and stuff but this was like pre-internet man you know, really, that's probably my wildest touring stories I can ever tell anyone is this was I was calling people over the phone to book concerts. Uh-huh. I was physically mailing demo tapes. Right. Yeah. And then when we were getting ready for tour, I'd go to the AAA and get all these uh, maps or right when MapQuest came out, we'd build a binder of MapQuest. But there was no cell phones. There was no Internet. Dude, it's such we're a different tw- time. 22 year old kids that. Have no idea what's going on in life, just traveling the country trying to figure out where we're going and how to get there. It's how, crazy. How were you guys traveling? Were you like, did you guys get like a van? Yeah, we have a van with a trailer behind it. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Because we were probably dude. living off five bucks a day. It wasn't like we had anything sweet, you know? Did you guys have hair? I did it, but the guys all had mohawks and charged hair. And, okay. Okay. I don't know. It might be hard. To, I don't know if I can fucking find you. Dude, the Escaped and then Rose City Hardcore. Rose City Hardcore? Yeah. The Escaped? Rose City, R O S E. Yep, it's for Portland. City Hardcore. But we did it for about five years, man. Where I'd, we'd be home for a month or two, and then back on the road for a month or two, home for a month. Like we lived, we had a similar to what they have the fight house here. We had a band house. We all lived together, mm-hmm. shared the bills. That's a, like another thing, and I think that really linked in common with me with the team is that we shared all our food. We were going to 
going yeah. to the food pantries together. We were sharing our shirts. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, Dude, the struggle, like going through hard shit with other people brings you so close together. No doubt. Yeah. Did you have a – Is I see this Rose City Hardcore and I see a bridge. Yeah, that's our album. Is that your album cover? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's something like a blog spot. New York City Hardcore. What's that? I don't know if that's you. I see, this is why I need a Jamie Vernon, bro. But so, damn, dude, you've had a wild ass life. So you, so that's so interesting because you know, you know, when you meet somebody, you don't know their whole story, and you don't know like where in their story you're meeting them because it's like depending on 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 when you meet somebody is how you're going to view them, right? right? So it's like, man, I, if somebody who's lived many different lives, it's like you might know me. Like for me, for example, it's like you might know me as like a fighter or you might know me as like a, just a jiu-jitsu guy. Like some people have no idea I even fight because they're just they're so used to like seeing me as jiu-jitsu. Right. Or some people now they're like, oh, you're just like a podcast guy. Like you're the podcast guy. So it's like you don't – it could be a number of things just depending on when somebody catches you in life. For sure. And it, it's funny you put it that way because I was just thinking about this the other day. They seem like different lifetimes, each one of them. Like, right. I was posting some stuff yesterday, like reminiscing of the band, and I was looking back, and I'm like, man, that was a, a whole different life. I was a, here was a young kid in a van just traveling the country, meeting people, you know, sleeping on couches, right. playing music. Like, think that, to think that I did that is crazy. Right. But how right? cool is that story? That was awesome. And, and the friends I met there are still friends to this day, you know? Like, yeah. Like, I made amazing connections, you know, networking was, I mean, it was just incredible. I got yeah. to experience so much cool stuff that, where, how else would I have been able to, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, shit, man, that is, uh, that's like, that, that's such an experience, right? Like, that's something that I, you would never want to do as an old person because it would be so miserable, but when you're young and you're just, like, just doing crazy shit, all the stories that you've accumulated, like, I feel like that's the time to do it, man. Like, And to me, that's the wealth. Like, I think we've talked about it before. I'm a social worker. I don't make money. I've never, never really had much money. Yeah. You know, um, to me, life's all about making stories, man, having stories, like making good experiences and those memories, you know, so that right. we sit here and talk about them or my late nights when I'm out with the guys and we're just rambling on and I'm like, oh, yeah, this one time, you know, to me, that's right. way more important than anything. Dude, you know? experiences over things every day of the week, man. Yeah, and how many people got to travel around with their best friends to play music, you know? Dude. We yeah, very good, but we had a great time, that's you know? Exactly, dude. Hey, growing up here in the Midwest... And I don't know if you've noticed this, but the narrative is a little bit different for kids coming up. It's always like, man, you should really, you know, find somebody to to be with and and like go to school and get your degree and go to, and like go get a nine to five and kind of like settle down. Right. I, I feel like the the whole narrative is just tr to try to push kids right into um, just responsibility and bills and like weigh people down with debt and just like you should just be doing like this is the path, and it's not really um, often like told to uh to like go and like do shit try shit travel right. like be risky like it's okay like that's the fucking time to do it you don't sure. you don't need to really be worrying about your 401k when you're i didn't go back 20, to college so i was 20. almost 30 years old see you know? like it's and not if I too late went after high school i would have failed because i didn't know what i wanted to do i didn't have a goal yet yeah you know? it wasn't until i was invested in psychology where i was like this is what i want yeah you know yeah and you probably would have had some some debt for no reason yeah for sure yeah and oftentimes it's especially coming right out of high school it's it's like uh you're a loser if you don't take that path. Definitely. You know what I mean? And it's like, man, I don't know why you're making kids feel that way because life is, is you know, it's in the grand scheme, it's short, but it's actually pretty long too. You know what right. I'm saying? You know, you don't have to have it all figured out tomorrow. But when you're a kid, you feel like you have to have everything figured yeah, out yesterday. Yeah, there's plenty of time for it to work itself out. Yeah, you feel like sure. time's running out though when you're a kid. You remember right. that feeling? Yeah. Dude, it was crazy. Another big difference too, and this is probably more generation than regional, mm -hmm. but there's not – the same pro social activities around for kids that there was for us. Like for me, there was T ball, there was wrestling, you know, mat clubs, football. Like yeah. we were busy as kids all the time. We never had a lot of time to just sit around. And when we weren't, you know, culturally was way different too, right? So mm -hmm. we were, if the sun was out, we were out playing football or we were boxing or you know what I mean? We we're riding bicycles, doing dumb stuff, but right. we were out being active kids a lot. Yeah. That I think shaped our generation a little bit different too. Yeah. Because you know, how much did you learn from sports? Sports taught me a lot about what I know about life, you know? And mm -hmm. in fact, enough that that's why we're still drawn to them, right? We're still competing mm -hmm. and doing sports, you know? Yeah. Dude, so much so for me, I look, so I look at, at, at 
like movement as a whole as like like a, like a form of expression and like like it's like a, a language in itself like if you look at body language that's like you know that's nonverbal communication that's just like the movement and like the subtleties in our body language right so i look at at movement as like an expression and for me i feel very comfortable when i'm doing sports like i feel good when i'm wrestling so you know how you know how typically whether it's wrestling and then you go and do jujitsu and there'll be there'll be things that are like similar but they'll have like different names right that's why i'm like movement is kind of like is is like the expression and then and then however you whatever you learn first is just kind of like the language that you use to 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 like explain the movement you know what i'm saying so like if you're a wrestler then you might use these terms if you're a judo guy you might use these terms if you're a jujitsu guy you might use these terms but they all kind of mean the same shit usually to explain a certain particular movement, right. right? So for me, I always say that wrestling was like my first language that I learned. So whenever like I'm learning jujitsu or something, I typically like relate it back yeah, no, to, that makes sense. to wrestling. I don't know what my point was with that though. Well, I, and I guess mine was just, if you just think the life lessons you learn, right? Like if you want to get good, you have to put in the work. That yeah. actions have consequences. You're not gifted anything in sports, right? You got to put in the work. You right. You put in the work. Yeah. Those yeah. are things that stuck with me, even in the band, right? We're not just going to meet someone famous. And they're going to jump us on tour. We had to keep playing shows and being active and working hard and making yourself right. known. Like, all that comes to me from learning that in sports that's what practice is for that's the point of practicing that's the dedication being on time like just so many things you learn at sports and you don't realize yes. how important they are later in life. You That's know? very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've learned so many. Th- the, like the one thing that always sticks with me is like, uh, you know, if you're if you're on, you know, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. I remember football. I always heard that shit all the time. But I, like I said, wrestling made me realize what it really means to work hard. Yeah, there's an accountability piece big on those individual sports. Yes, for sure. yeah, yeah, and it was and it was that sport that was uh, it was the first time I was ever broken. Like our coach made a point to like break us down so he could build us up. Yep. And I remember one time in particular, it was like a Sunday practice. We came in. Um, I felt I was kind of feeling like I was hot shit because I was. Um, like I, I tend to do the best on the team. Like me and my practice partner, we both did really well at tournaments. I'm like, all right, whatever. So we come in. Usually it's just like a lift, maybe a run. Um, maybe we would wrestle or something. But this day, our coach seemed to have a very uh, particular mindset and agenda. He seemed a little pissed off. He made us lift crazy hard. It's like steaming in there. We lift crazy hard. Then we go, we fucking run really hard. We had to go run um, around the hallway. And uh, you had to make it around in like 45 seconds or something like that. And uh, so you're sprinting. And if you didn't make it at that time, then they added one. And I think we ran like 16, which I think that's the equivalent of like two miles. So we basically just like sprinted two miles of that. So then after that, we're like, oh, surely we're done. We're all really tired. Nope. We went and live wrestled for another hour. Crazy. Crazy exhausted, dude. We're all crying. We're all exhausted. Like he he got through it. He broke us that day, right? But then I realized... I hit because I hit a second wind. I'm like, man, you think there's times where you're about to break and maybe you do break, but you're actually like maybe breaking through a wall and you can do more than you thought possible. Right. Right. And it's all it all is with the mind. Yeah. Right. So it's like, man, and there's the team piece, too. Right. Yeah, you're miserable man. there with other, with people, other people, people that are going through the same misery that didn't quit on you. They're sticking it out. So those those connections, which that right. translates to where we're at now, the teams we're on now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, man, it's it's uh, the community is my favorite piece of uh, jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, it's my favorite piece of everything. You yeah, because like, to me, I like making connections. I like meeting people. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's the biggest part. Yeah, know? yeah, and that's as and that's probably the strongest like the piece about Mount Vernon, right? Which is kind of what drew sure. you out here. Yeah, half the time I go to the gym to catch up with the guys. Yeah, just know? have a good time. Be- between A, I need it for my mental health, and B, I just want to go BS and catch up with the guys. Yeah, a lot know? of it's for mental health for me too, dude. It's like, yeah. oh man, dude. Especially this time of year, man, when yeah, it's fucking, I'll notice it big. It's only, you know, daylight for like eight hours. It's like, oh yep. my gosh, dude. This The, the seasonal uh, depression is real, man. I, right. I try to, I'm trying to do better about just making sure I'm getting the sun exposure when I can. Yeah, that's what was hard in the Northwest for sure. That yeah, did that really like big time because yeah. summers are amazing you're having this great summer you're outside you know there's so much to do there so you're in the mountains or you're yeah. boating or on the lake you're spending all the summertime and then all of a sudden it's just gray and dark for six oh, months oh gosh and that hits you real hard real quick how cool is it riding your bike through the northwest amazing oh my gosh amazing. definitely way different than here right yeah like, now it's just flat <laughs> straight 
you know, um, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's definitely beautiful. I, dude, I've never seen, like, the Redwoods and stuff, but Amazing. I, I'm, it's so high on my priority list to go check out. And even stuff like that we got to do on tour, you know, because we were like, oh, we'll, let's, go, let's go this way home or the back way. So there was stuff we got to see as kids, too, you know. Yeah. Or because we were all broke, we'd camp. You know? so <laughs> yeah, it saved you money. Yeah, so, like, we, we stayed in, in the northern Redwoods once where we just all camped and, really? and hung out. Yeah. Dude, how crazy was touring? Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we could do what – the way we did now with the internet and everything mm, else. Gets, too much evidence. Man, we would go and we'd get in fights with people and then you're going to advertise when you're coming back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how, did we not, how did we not get jumped? And, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, my God, yes. And, and, you know, underage drinking and whatever. We were just doing crazy stuff because we were like unsupervised youth. Just right. On the road to party, really. Dude, you're you adults, know? right? My, tw- my twin brother was our driver. and he, <laughs> At the time, um, I spent most of my life drug and alcohol free, so we'd get all these uh, – um, drink tickets and i'd give them to the other guys in the band and then we'd be the sober guys and have to drive everyone home oh was that's so funny yeah i mean the, the stories alone were amazing places yeah. we stayed incredible like yeah it was nuts memories super cool holy shit dude so now you're just a boring guy yeah you're man. just like you're, you're married and you lift train ride that's what i do yeah right, man. that's cool as hell though man you know it's is illinois is an interesting spot because like it's it's really cool like it's beautiful you're in the small town but and I'm, i don't want to go down like a political lane but it's uh i've just noticed like a lot of the the state is influenced by like chicago like just one massive city right which is way different than the rest of the state Oregon it's, similar like that. It's like it's got just Portland and then everything else. Yeah, and it's like you have this you have this one city that completely controls an entire state essentially. Like that's an interesting like kind of like dichotomy, like a place to live in. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like we love it here, man. And I think the big difference A is club related, right? Like I told you we just got messed with by the cops a lot. Mm-hmm. Right. How, I'm not dumb, I'm not naive. I know if we go out and break the law we're gonna get in trouble. Mm-hmm. But if we don't they don't mess with us here. Right. So that's especially coming with the personal beefs that I had and things the way I was treated. Yeah. That's been huge. The pace of life, the low cost of living, which for, works well with my, my uh, you know, what I do way for a living. Cheaper, right? Yeah, man. I mean, all of that stuff has made life so chill and easy here that it's we're just so happy to just flow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like that is the best way. And, and here's what's crazy. I grew up in all these different areas doing these gnarly things. I feel like my tightest and closest friendships, no disrespect to everyone back home, is right here. Yeah. You know? Like you found Like I've home. met some really good, just genuine, solid people. Yeah. And I would have a hard time leaving. Yeah. You know? we're, you... lo- we're locked in. We ain't going nowhere. Dude, love it. And now you're doing social work here. Yep. Yeah. You have your own program or? Yeah, I'm a supervisor of a, a, a um, it's a group called Multisystemic Therapy is the mm-hmm. type of therapy we do. So what we do is we work with teens that are on parole probation. Okay. Uh, 12 to 17 year old roughly. And what's cool or different than us or about us is that we work with them in all of the ecology, right? That the multi systems. Mm. So we, I can work with their coach. I can work with their teacher. So we don't actually do much counseling with the youth alone. It's very caregiver focused because you'll notice a lot of these times in broken homes or issues, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, the family the family system is is where there might be some drivers or things that are pushing those behaviors. Yeah, yeah. So you're taking a very like holistic approach, right? Like you're 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 working as a team with all these different right aspects. Because the, the goal is we're not coming there and fixing anything. We're coming there and empowering caregivers mm-hmm. to keep it on when we step out of the picture. So it's very intensive, but it's only a four month program. But we're meeting. When instead of them coming to see us, we go to their home. We're in the homes. We're in the schools. I go to court with them. Yeah, three or four days a week per client. Mm-hmm. And what's your fi- so is what you're finding a lot of your so a lot of it is just is just rooted back in, in kind of like the home situation with yeah, a lot of big these time, man. Learn, yeah man learn behaviors and yeah. family systems for sure yeah man from I guess what I've learned is that you know it's just so so much of uh, I, it can manifest in many different ways I, f- I found it I guess in people but it's it's all ro- like rooted back in like trauma yeah whether it's like maybe you're obese or, you know, maybe you're, you're like lashing out with violence or, you know, maybe you're pushed like schizophrenia, whatever the case may be. Like I just do have some crazy examples, but it's like, no, but you're right. For like, sure. A lot of things usually, are very trauma based. It's and usually that's rooted why in trauma. Most therapy now is trauma focused because we, we recognize that, right? We recognize a lot of behaviors are based off trauma. Yeah. What's cool about the program we do or the type of therapy we do, cause I transfer this to everything in life now Yeah. is we have these things called fit circles. So say your issues going to school on time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put that in the middle of the circle. I'm going to say, what drives that behavior? 
okay, he's up late at night. Maybe he doesn't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. He's got bullies at school. So I put in all these things we call drivers. Okay. And then I attack them one at a time. Mm. So if like, okay, now I'm changing your schedule. Maybe now you're now you're not staying up so late. You're not tired. Okay, now you're getting a better communication with your teacher. So you know when homeworks do. Like if we fix the little drivers, we'll fix the overall behavior instead of being like, oh, here's medication or yeah. oh, talk through it with me. We're actually making quality fixes where that once we're out of the picture, they still have the success and the support they need to move forward. Yeah, and, and so that's been super cool. That's important, right? Actually treating the cause. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's such a we have such a failed like healthcare system in so many ways in that I think that we're just, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a model just based off of, of just what's a symptom and then what is the, prescri like the medication that we can, right. you know, a, you know, to give them to address a symptom, right? It's never really, well, what's the actual root cause of the problem yeah, and how, how can we, we and how do we fix that, right? And actually make them healthy, right? Like that's the healthcare as opposed to just like putting the bandaid on it and just, you know, sick care. Right. Right. And just I won't ever advocate that medication doesn't work, but I would say this, it works in conjunction with other things, right? Right. It works with therapy or like we were saying for... Depression's a super common one where if you're physically active, you feel better, right? right? So say say you start eating healthier or you're drinking more water or you're getting plenty of sleep or you're working out. Right. That in conjunction with medication, great. Right. Or in conjunction with therapy, mm -hmm. but it's not none, – none of those stand on their own. Like it's one right. of those things where everyone has to do a little bit of everything. Or, you know, a lot of people don't need medication if they're doing those other things too. Right. It's but like – You're right. It's a quick fix, right? Right. Just take this. You'll be fine. Oh, what about the fact that you're drinking five days a week? Oh, that's not, I just have to take this pill. I'll be fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like not, let's not look at the other, like you said, the actual root causes. Right. And like, what can we do to help? Yep. And most of it takes effort, right? Which For is, sure. Which is, it's not, that doesn't sell. Yep. You have to want change. <laughs> yeah, man. And I don't, man, that's a whole conversation itself. Just, uh, change like, uh, behavior influence, like influencing change. Yeah. I don't even know how to, I mean, I, I I've done like some personal training and some health coaching and it is so hard to influence behavior. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Like if somebody isn't truly ready and like wanting to do that, it's very difficult. And that's why I quickly fell out of love with substance abuse counseling. Mm. Most people that are court ordered, most people didn't see they had a problem, didn't want a problem. And I didn't see the types of changes I wanted to see. Right. Mm, yeah. And you take it personal as a therapist. If you're not seeing progress, like I'm, is it me? I'm not doing right. Right. You know? Versus I also facilitated a group, um, called men's challenging violence. And it was a, it was group therapy for perpetrators of domestic violence. Mm. So I'm meeting with guys that were all there charged with domestic violence at some point. And here we are teaching like more of a feminist perspective, you know, um, just kind of like a shared worldview, like mm -hmm. an updated worldview, right? Yeah. Again, fighting against learned behavior, family patterns, all sorts of crazy things that people believe that aren't true, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when I saw major change. And that's when I was like, oh, this is awesome because I can physically see it, you know? Yeah. You get a guy that comes in one day that's possessive and controlling. He doesn't think he is. He thinks it's normal and okay. And then at the end of the program, yeah. he's like, man, you can't say that about her. You can't talk to her like that. You hear him saying that to other people in the group. And yeah. That is what's rewarding, right? You know, but that's like you said, he's physically seeing that change, right? Is, is a huge difference. You get some real feedback there. Yeah. Are you, um, are you like, uh, are you, have you like kept up or like anything or research on anything with, um, like the, the use of like psychedelics or like psilocybin for therapy? Is that anything you've been looking into? Yeah, yeah, or? because I'm microdose, so I know it works for me. <laughs> yeah. You know? Is that something that you're, you're interested in like facilitating, like psycho assisted therapy? It's tough, right? Because everything I read about it's such a controlled environment that a lot of right. it sounds almost awkward. Right? Okay, yeah. Like, I'm going to sit here and smoke this with you and you're going to talk me through it. I don't know if I'm in the mood for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know what like what it looks like or, or how it works or anything like that. I know I've heard um, – do you follow, like, Rick Doblin and, like, MAPS or anything like that? Mm -hmm. So Rick Doblin, I think he's based out of San Francisco, and MAPS is the multidisciplinary – um, Association of Psychedelic Studies, and they've just they've done a lot of work in the space. Uh, I think since like the '70s, and I believe they're on like stage three trials with uh, I believe MDMA, and I think they might also be working on psilocybin. I think mushrooms, um, San Francisco, and then Oregon got some license where they can start working with that in the studies too. Have they? Mm -hmm. See, so it's like we're we're, they're, we're I feel like we're pretty close. To, to a time and I think according to like Rick Dobbin within like maybe, maybe like the next like three or four years even yeah. to where we're going to start seeing these clinics pop up across the country to where 
you know, people can go for therapy and they're going to need like therapists to mend these. So I don't know right. what, like what the certification or the training or, or anything is going to be like. So that'd be cool though. Yeah. It's almost going to be like the wild west. So right. I almost wonder, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder what the train is going to be like. I, I'm sure it's going to be a, uh, like a controlled environment, but you would hope it's like an inviting, relaxed environment. It's like, it's like you walk in here and it's like, all right, we're just going to chill in the living room. Right. And like do this thing. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like, but it, it's super intriguing. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's already proven that it, positively influences brain chemistry right right so there's a bunch of positive benefits now it's just figuring out how do we make how do we roll it out and make it work right right yeah yeah i don't know i don't know what the answer is but i'm, I'm, I'm glad. excited about it i think it's cool i'm very excited i'm glad people are figuring it out right for sure i almost think that you have to have a pretty heavy experience to actually appreciate microdosing because otherwise, you're just wondering, is it working? Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what a lot of people just say, I don't feel it, or I don't want to trip. And you're like, no, you're not going to trip. But here's the, you're like trying to even explain it. Or right. like, hey, was that a good dose? Oh, I don't know. I don't think I felt it. I mean, it was probably a good dose then, right? <laughs> right. From a, Yeah, from a microdose perspective, right? And that's why I'm like, man, maybe you need to have like a little bit of heavier experience. So you're like, all right, I know what the come up feels like. I know yeah. what the ride feels like. So you can kind of ride the wave. And then when, when you do do a microdose, you're like, oh, okay, okay, I can feel that. I can feel that. Because I'll do it before a roll. I like to do it before a roll. You yeah, know? I feel tuned um, in. I do Kratom before I lift. Like there's certain things I do as like pre-workout. So. Yeah, I like Kratom a lot. I yeah. do too. yeah. I um I did some psilocybin last night. Nice. I yeah I, was, I had this podcast this morning and the psilocybin kept me up to like two or three, and so like I woke up probably at like what time did I wake like probably like ten or ten thirty, ten thirty probably and I think we podcasted at like eleven or something. Oh straight so, to it. Yeah, so I was only up for like an hour, dude. And I'm like I'm I'm drinking coffee. I'm talking to the guy. I'm like man, I'm sorry, man. Like I had some psilocybin last night. Like, I just didn't want him to feel like. I'm like, man, I'm just sorry. It's just really early. I've only been right. up for an hour, bro. But I just really enjoy those experiences to where it's just like, just kind of tap in, see how I'm feeling. Um, it, it just allows me to kind of just have some perspective on some things. Yeah, it's good. And just work through some thoughts sometimes. But you're going through with that structured plan already, right? Like, I'm going to do this to work through things. Like, you have to kind of be in that mindset. Yes, sure. yes. I don't like – so I feel like a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding of of, like – they think, or oh, what? Like, what is tripping? Or I'm gonna like, what's a hallucination? I'm gonna have right. like, they don't understand. It's like, no, man, I'm not gonna sit here and think I'm a fucking glass of orange juice. I'm not yeah. gonna think there's a pink elephant I've over done there. Way too much of all of those things, and still have never gotten there. That doesn't know? happen, yeah. right? You know, so but people have these weird misconceptions in, in their mind of like what the experience is gonna be like. Right. And it's scary if that's what you think. I was like the first time I tried, tried DMT. Right. The only reason I was able to do it is I had it in a vape, so I could work myself up to blast off. Mm. Because my initial thought was, you're telling me I'm going to take one hit of this thing and it'll be on a different planet? That yeah. scares the shit out of me. Bro. Bro. <laughs> Have I ever told you about when I did the DMT? For the... Dude. I don't think so. I did blast off off of one hit, dude. It was crazy. It was so powerful. I wasn't ready. I yeah, thought see, I was I ready. I think I worked myself up to it that when I did blast off, I was amped. Mm. Because I wanted to be there. And I like worked up to it. Yes. You know? I took a couple hits to get the body high. A couple more to get the like wah-wahs. And then yeah. a couple more. And you see the you know, shapes and stuff. But, mm. then, but really had to hit it. Before I had that crazy out of body experience, so you were ready for it. Yeah. You kind of were tipped. Yeah, no, not me, my friend. I hit it. I was like, Whew. and then I was just thinking, you kind know, of like when you do like psilocybin or LSD, how the experience is still very much like here, right? Right in this plane of existence, yeah, dude. Not DMT. I thought that was going to be the case with DMT, right? And I, I'm looking up and I see some geometrics for a second. And then all of a sudden, like now in hindsight, I know what happened was like I saw those and I got super overwhelmed. Like as I'm blasting off, I closed my eyes. I didn't realize I closed my eyes, though. Yeah. I just like just took everything. I, yeah. Mine like feel like they were forced closed. Yeah. I was trying to keep them open. And also I was like, bam. And the minute I closed, I was flying through. Space. Exactly. <laughs> Same thing, dude. Like it, like opening my eyes, like I felt like this thing overcame and just sucked me up. Yeah. And then I was just. Whoosh. It's so funny talking to people that have done it, how similar their experiences. It's the only drug that i've ever done with other people where we've all had very similar Dude. experiences like i had like i'd done so much just getting ready to blast off and there was kind of this shadowy creature in front of me and he like slowly touched me it wasn't scary anything was there but he touched me to close my eyes and as soon as mm. i did is when i was blasting through Gone. space and now you're like yeah i felt like something wanted me to close my eyes and then i went through space i'm like that, that's what i said kind of i never really thought of it as a shadowy creature but yeah it was like this i felt like i was engulfed in this blackness yeah yeah and that dude it fucked i just i remember being very discombobulated 
Like, I didn't know which way was up. There's all these colors. I felt like I was almost, like, going through hallways, like, turning corners crazy fucking fast, but every which way. I didn't know what... I thought I was, like, in a coliseum. Yeah, dude. And I I felt like I was going to be there forever. I was so scared. (laughs) The one thing that's kept me straight on that stuff is I've always been able to keep my self-talk. Like, I never... Like, I've been able to say, hey, this is a trip. You brought yourself here. This yes. is, and the biggest one for that is it's a short trip. Yes. You know, I don't have to get into that mushroom mindset of, oh, I still have to do this for six more hours. How am mm-hmm. I going to, you know, but I was like, you know, and cause I remember one time I was a pretty good one at DMT and things were kind of getting dark Yeah. and I had that mental talk and all of a sudden everything just literally lightened up and we're like bright. And I was like, see, I have control. Oh. And that wasn't good, but I had to have that talk with myself. Yes. No, I just freaked the fuck out, dude. I was just freaking out. I'm just like, oh my God. I'm gonna be here forever. I was not ready for this. Oh my god! I just want to be back. I just want to be were back out for like thirty seconds, probably. Yeah, I think it was like I was like it was like ten minutes or something like that. And then whenever I came to, I was just like curled up right here, like next to my couch, like on the on the edge of my couch there. And you know, but the entire time, I felt like I was me. I was me the entire time. I wasn't yeah. my physical body wasn't there, but I was there. And like I I thought about that experience quite a bit since then, and. What I believe is that I was so scared, and what I th- like, I was so scared about it. And what I realized is that what kind of freaked me out was that uh, you know I thought I was going to be there forever. And when I re- when I think about it, I realize now that was the moment that I, like I realized like I am like I have a body. I'm not my body because I've always thought like I've always associated who I am and my experience with like what I see in the mirror and what I can feel and touch but like I, I was still very much me but I was somewhere the right. fuck else and like I was like man like like I don't know like you can call it a soul you can call it energy it's whatever you want to call it sure. yeah dude whatever you want to call it but like that is me that's what I am yeah. and this body is just like this temporary plane of existence it put me very much at ease with with one death same and then two like I've always had this internal resistance to Christianity and religion, but like growing up in Missouri, like my uncle's like a Pentecostal preacher and like I've very much kind of been in and out of the church and had this inner struggle. And, uh, but now I'm just like, nah, man, like that's not for me. Like, I don't really believe in that shit like that. You, if you want to believe that, that story, then that's okay for you. Like, I'm not going to judge anybody who's Christian or religious or anything. Right. It's on you, but that's not me. Same, Either yeah. way, it put me very much at peace with my decision. Same. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I went man. Through, that's what's the trip I'm saying is we, yeah, all dude. Go, we all go through such similar stuff off of a certain drug that we have very similar reactions. Man. It's a trip. It, it, it totally put me at ease with this this life and it's one dmt is one of those things i've done it once or twice i'm good for the whole year like i don't like you know what yeah I, mean? I don't have this intense urge to be yeah. like oh let me go do that again. no once fact, you have dude, a real strong one i was almost scared i was you nervous know? dude i had a really intense one the last one it was all good but it was really intense and it almost scared me to the point of same thing you're like oh am i stuck like this and you're going so then afterwards i felt great but then I was just good for a while. I was like, oh, I don't need any more. Yeah, you know? yeah. I had that experience with psilocybin one time. I took seven grams and blasted the fuck off. And where I messed up was um, I took it early in the day, and we had plans with friends later on. We were going oh, down so to yeah. a landing. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going to blast off. Like, I'm like, man, I'm leaving this plane. I thought I was going to lay down and go to sleep and be gone until, like, tomorrow. I'm like, I'm not going to wake up till tomorrow, but I need to be here. And I was just fighting it, fighting yeah. it, fighting it. And that wasn't a good thing. But it kind of – I still went kind of – to this place a little bit. It was like blasting me off almost to that same place I go to a DMT. Yeah. So it's, it's just like, too long for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's just, it. it's wild. I like shit, to microdose dude. that stuff, but that's it. Yeah. But I'm very, conv- I'm, I'm convinced that like, that's a place. I don't know where it is or what it is. Right. But I feel like that's a place. Yeah, it's so a thing. Cause I feel like about it, I'm ready to go back. <laughs> when I'm there, I feel like whatever it is, like, we, like everything's one. Like I'm, it, it's, it's me. And it's a good mental reset. Yes. You know, like you said, you wake up just kind of feeling like bigger picture, more part of things and the things that were bothering, you don't seem as important. Yeah. You're stressed. Yeah. It's interesting stuff, man. It's definitely interesting stuff stuff I, I enjoy i enjoy it i'm very excited to see where like the field of uh of just therapy yeah like is taken now that we're looking at some of these other compounds like mdma and psilocybin and and uh and ibogaine and a whole bunch you know a lot of different things yeah well even like you know like i said with my neck injury you know i don't like taking a ton of advil or ibuprofen or stuff like that and i don't take pain pills yeah I mean, you know, maybe to party from time to time. You know <laughs> like, I don't have a, a prescription to them or anything. Um, Kratom's helped me a ton with that. But mm. I've also had to figure out my doses with that. Yes. Because, you know, I kind of get groggy when I come out of it or tired or I build tolerance pretty quick. So 
finding different strands and all that. And then I, man, I, I do it before I, before I roll every time now. And yeah. It's like my go-to. Yeah. I like it. It makes me feel nice and even. Yep. Um, kind of and tunes, a lot tunes me in. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it, I think, I believe it attaches to the opiate receptors, correct? Yep. Although it's not technically an opiate. I believe it's in the coffee family. Yeah. I, I would imagine just from a drug and alcohol background that, you know, any of these like non-narcotic pain medications or stuff like that, if they attack the same receptors, you it still, is that you could build a tolerance to them and you still have withdrawal symptoms. Then what, what's it, what's the difference? Yeah. So you know what it, I mean, yeah. So yeah, it might be classified different. I do think that there could be some, you know, dangers to it if you're not, you know, taking it appropriately or right. whatever. Um, but I do know that it's been a happy alternative for a lot of people to get off of opiates and other drugs. Yeah. It's, it's helped quite a bit of people get off of opiates, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what I've read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so much so that in like Southeast Asia, it's like illegal to get created. It's illegal in a lot of places. Right. And they made it illegal here two years. Well, I guess right before I moved about four years ago and they, for whatever reason, got overturned. It was illegal for a few months. Yeah. I know there's been a lot of battles back and forth here in the States, like on Kratom. I imagine at some point it will be because it's too good to be legal. It's, yeah, man. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, I had this guest on the show. She's a, a huge advocate. She lives in Chicago. Her name's Nina Iden. She went through this thing, or she's going through this thing. It's a very severe case. It's like this uh, this steroidal withdrawal where like she was prescribed like topical steroids for like a skin issue and um her skin basically became like addicted to it and now um like these withdrawal symptoms occur to where she becomes extremely like um flared and rashed and inflamed and like it caused her to like lose all at what like at the height and worst of it she's 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 made leaps and bounds but like at the height and worst of it like she had like she looked like she's just like very scarred like the skin was flaky she lost her hair um it was she was like she almost looked like a, like a like a cancer patient yeah, or it's wild yeah i mean it was just wild and it was from these steroids and uh kratom is like kind of one of the things that actually helped her like on her road to recovery so she's a big advocate for it and she yeah, she really helped me like understand it and and uh learn about it and it's interesting stuff for sure man yeah plant medicines fascinate me i think with any any sort of drug for the most part just the self-awareness how does it affect me how am i reacting to it and i think there's pros and cons to most of them and i'm not talking like the meths or the heroines but you know what i'm saying yeah am yeah, i going yeah, to yeah. work five days a week am i paying my dip my bills do i need it when i wake up in the morning like there's those those check the boxes is this a problem or not you right know? But you have to have that that self-control and self-talk and i think a lot of the problem with people that don't is they don't have that self-control yeah i think ultimately humans are always going to alter consciousness it's just inevitable you yeah. can't you can't even keep drugs out of prison right we're gonna find a way yeah you know what i'm saying well, with, with society stress and pol political stress work stress money stress yeah who's trying to stay sober you yeah know? You know what like, dude and you and you see it across a ton of different uh species it's not just humans that yeah. like to you know uh, alter consciousness right so it's just a part of humans and now it's crazy that we treat it as like a, a, a criminal offense right it's, you know it's just at, at the very at most it's 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 like a, a mental health thing right or it's, it's, well, it's, it's criminalized most drugs or yeah that's that's drugs. great man you know what i'm saying there, i think there's a lot of models to show how we can handle this differently right yeah for sure man it's exciting Other countries stuff. do great with it yeah man i think what uh portugal is completely decriminalized and they've been so for a long long time right and there's yeah. there's a lot of places where it's like all right if you do get caught with with drugs it's like all right you're not going to jail but we're gonna we're gonna you know you're gonna get a fine you're gonna get an option to seek treatment yeah right? that's what oregon is the problem is is they didn't balance out the social services with it too so right now there's not enough drug and alcohol counselors or therapists in the area to, to meet the needs you actually have to support the system yeah right so i mean it, you know they're learning as they go yeah they get that it's new but exciting times dude it's positive for sure yeah man well dude i want to be respectful of your time we've been talking for a while now it's uh it's, it's almost six o'clock all right dude this has been so fun for sure thank you so much for taking the time yeah. man i'd um, love to do it again sometime we talk about like my injuries and coming back and training after dude yeah full spinal fusion and yeah you've had <laughs> a crazy ride though no, we've else, only yeah. like scratched the surface bro so yeah anytime bro seriously cool. um is there anybody anything you want to direct the people towards or anything like that the place they can check you out or uh, OG underscore Mooch on Instagram. There you, you go. Know, uh, what you see is what you get there. Right on, my man. But no, that's about it. Okay, cool. Um, well, right on, man. Thanks again. For sure, homie. All right, everybody. Bye.